Well, uh, welcome everyone uh, to the panel on thinking about drugs and substances in our communities. My name is Chris Dranos and I use even pronouns. I'm calling in from the Toronto CDRC office. The session will be from 10 uh, and at 10.55 a.m. PST to support the transition to the next session. I'll provide an introduction to our panelists before their presentation and we will end with a live Q&A and discussion. Before we get started, I'd like to address a few housekeeping items. First, CBRC has established some community guidelines for the summit to help ensure a safe, respectful, and inclusive experience for everyone. This includes respecting personal experiences and ensuring that we are sharing the space with public participants. A link to the summit 2021 page is in the chat for more information on these guidelines for participation. We're also joined by Luke Gray, who will monitor the chat to help these guidelines. We understand that some of the content discussions may be difficult to hear, and encourage any participant in need to access our counseling support on the summit uh, participant directory uh, located on the conference platform uh, a counseling coordinator will be listed the coordinator will help connect you with the counselor from the formal active listening support session we also encourage folks to post their questions or comments into the chat box we will be holding all audience questions until after the panelists presentations please be aware that there will be an Automated closed captioning available in both English and French. Lastly, we have recorded today's session, which will be published within a couple of days on this platform. Therefore, we ask that you refrain from recording today's session yourself. At the end of the session, you're welcome to share your feedback using our evaluation form, which will be available when you scroll down on the page and select the evaluation button. Now, um, as an introduction to our panel topic, thinking about drugs and substances within our communities, Humans have used substances throughout our collective known history. This includes alcohol, tobacco, cannabis, and what some might refer to as illicit substances, such as opioids not described for pain management or methamphetamines. Modern drug policies and laws are often rooted in prohibitionist ideology and are used in oppressive, racist, ableist, homophobic, and transphobic ways. People in our community have a range of experience related to substances and are in different stages of their personal substance use journey which could include never using substances, use socially or regularly, dependence, abstinence, or recovery, and there is no correct end goal. Substances can be beneficial or harmful, depending on the context of the situation. Now, I have the pleasure of introducing uh, first of our panel presentation, uh, Tara Chanady, uh, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the École de Santé Publique de l'Université de Montréal, she also lectures at the University Department of Communication, where she obtained her PhD working on lesbian, bisexual, and queer media representations and spaces. She identifies as a lesbian and a dyke and will be presenting building community-based knowledge around cannabis and mental health among LGBTQS2 plus youth. Hello, and welcome to our presentation. We would like to begin by acknowledging that Jojage Montreal is located on the unceded indigenous lands of the Canyon Cahaga Nation. Our presentation is titled Building Community Based Knowledge Around Cannabis and Mental Health Amongst Two Spirited LGBTQEI Plus Youth in Quebec. It is led by Olivier Ferlat at the Ecole de Santé Publique de l'Université de Montréal and the Centre de Recherche en Santé Publique. It is also affiliated to a research lab, CoLab. Our research objective is to better understand the relationship between mental health and cannabis use amongst two-spirited LGBTQEI plus use in Quebec. Our research is also affiliated to the Mental Health Commission of Canada and to the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. Our methodology is rooted in community-based research and is led by a queer youth team. We use a photo voice methodology through which we ask the participants to take pictures of their relation to their cannabis use, to their mental health issues, and to their gender and sexual identity. These pictures are later discussed in an interview with our queer youth-led team. The results are analyzed through an intersectional framework, meaning an attention to the variety of oppressions, of privileges, and of power dynamics faced by various positionalities. Our project demographic thus far amongst our 42 participants include a variety of gender and sexual identities. 16 of our participants identify as women, 6 as men, 18 as non-binary, 1 as gender fluid. 10 of our participants identify as trans. Half of our participants identify as queer, 
five as gay, four as lesbian, 10 as pansexual, and four, five as bisexual. A quarter of our participants identify as racialized, and a quarter of our participants live elsewhere in Quebec than in the larger region of Montreal. Some of them live in further rural regions. The medium age of our participants, which are aged 15 to 24, is 22. Through this presentation, we will walk you through three main themes that emerged in our preliminary analysis through the participants' photographies. The first photograph is described by the participant as representing the fact that I have a very bland experience of my sexuality and my bisexuality because my autism and my anxiety make connections more difficult. Because of that, I tend to put my sexuality in the background to the point where I have difficulties to consider myself as part of the LGBTQ community. This photo work presents an LGBT flag projected on a wall in my room. It is very bland and almost unrecognizable. There are a few colors, but it's hard to distinguish them from the white, gray, and neutral background. This picture points to the importance of socializing to develop sexual identities and feelings of belonging to a related community. Our research highlighted the role of cannabis amongst queer identified peers who struggle with mental illnesses, interrogating if there is a queer aspect to smoking cannabis. Some participants mentioned the role of cannabis within their queer circles, such as the participant 39, who said that it is almost cultural for people who are queer to smoke weed. That's what I found, at least in my age group. Observing LGBTQ people around me use cannabis for their own mental illness issues and even in a casual setting has encouraged me to try it for myself. Not like peer pressure or anything like that. It was like, oh, my queer friend or this queer person is using weed and has something. Why not try it as well? The second picture il illustrates how cannabis is used as a tool to deal with anxiety, sexuality, and body-related issues. Through this picture, the participant describes, I'm an anxious person who has a tendency to overthink everything. I was in a somewhat abusive relationship, and I had coping mechanisms that were not well adapted. Consuming cannabis before a sexual relationship allowed me to be more present, to focus less on what I looked like and more on what I felt, to let go, to have more fun. I wanted to illustrate with this photo the positive impact that cannabis had on my sexuality and on my relationship with my body, and also to the proximity I felt to my partner at that moment. Indeed, many participants illustrated the role of cannabis as a reflexive tool. Many said that it allowed them to have more introspective journeys, leading to the discovery and acceptance of sexual and gender identities. Consuming cannabis allowed many to escape hegemonic norms that they are faced with daily and to accept themselves by diminishing censorship and body-related anxieties in their reflection. This third and last photograph illustrates the use of cannabis as a coping method with its negative impacts. The participant says, this photo is titled Captive. It represents the captivity I felt during the confinement, when I was also in a violent relationship with a partner who consumed a lot of cannabis. I had bad anxiety and began to consume a lot of cannabis to deal with it. Because of this consumption, I developed memory and sleep problems. The rainbow represents my queerness, which I was questioning at the time, but my partner did not allow me to explore it. Many participants describe cannabis as more useful to deal with anxiety and other health-related issues as current health resources, which are deemed inadequate, thus portraying cannabis as a coping tool. Medical professionals were described as not very competent and knowledgeable, and not comfortable talking about cannabis use or about gender or trans-related issues in a non-marginalizing way. Participants were thus turning to cannabis to avoid the pressure of educating the specialists themselves, and of feeling further stigmatized by the healthcare resources that they were seeking to turn to for help. Finally, our research highlights the many use of cannabis as a reflexive and a coping tool in the face of marginalization and a lack of adequate and accessible healthcare resources. It highlighted both the positive and the negative impact of cannabis consumption for dealing with mental health issues. The potential of photo voice methodology to understand the participant points of view allows to reduce stigmas about cannabis use and mental health in relationship to two-spirited LGBTQI plus identities. 
For further inquiries about our presentation or to inquire about our upcoming exhibit, which will take place in the spring of 2022, do not hesitate to contact us. Thank you very much for your interest in our presentation. Presentation. Um, so Jared is the co-executive director of the Sexuality Education Resource Center, CERP of Manitoba, and has been engaged in sexual health programming and research for over 10 years. Jared is a social worker who recently completed his master's in community health sciences, congratulations, with plans to continue his research into his PhD next year. Hi everyone, my name is Jared Starr and I'm thrilled to be here with you today uh, at this year's summit for my short oral presentation titled Sex, Power and Subjectivity, The Good Reasons Behind Anabolic Androgenic Steroid Use Amongst Two-Spirit Gay Bi Queer Men in Manitoba. I want to begin by acknowledging that I am currently located uh, on the same lands where this research took place, which are the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, as well as the homeland of the Métis Nation, and that I am a guest on this land. Um, I'm really excited to share uh, this study with you. This was the, uh, these are the results from my graduate research, which I completed last year. Um, I'm very excited to share them with you because they are novel to, uh, to the Canadian landscape, despite being studied in other places. Um, and I found that there was definitely an opportunity to understand uh, non-prescribed steroid use better, including the implications from a social sciences lens um, applied to a health field. So this study took place last year, uh, and I'm going to go through the background methodology and methods very briefly so we can get to the salient a uh, piece of information I want to share with you at the end. Uh, so steroid use, non-prescribed, uh, is researched quite a lot uh, amongst public health fields. It typically focuses on cisgender heterosexual men. Um, it claims that it's motivated by increasing athletic performance or enhancing physical appearance, muscle strength, and or mass. Um, and it's found more prevalent among high school and college age students. <clears throat> It also frames this practice as illicit substance use and associates it with a wide range of negative health outcomes. It relies predominantly on quantitative methodologies with one meta-analysis declaring it a global public health issue. And there are only seven Canadian studies to date, not including my own that exist, uh, none of which uh, include a qualitative perspective. When we look at this topic uh, among two-spirit gay bi queer men, all of the research originates outside of Canada, primarily the US, Australia, UK, and New Zealand, relies on quantitative data, and all found significantly higher prevalence rates uh, than among non 2 sgbq plus male populations. Those studies associate this practice with increases in sexual risk-taking behaviors, illicit substance use, including meth use and MDMA and Molly, and a range of adverse mental health outcomes. They also suggested that there is a link between thinking about using steroids and various psychopathologies, including insomnia and suicidality. When we look at two-spirit gay bi queer men's health in Canada, I won't spend a lot of time here because I think we know uh, that there are disproportionate health outcomes, including among sexual health, mental health, and physical health. And so this really leads to a, a broader research question uh, about how anabolic androgenic steroid use is implicated in the production of subjectivities among two-spirit gay bi queer men in Manitoba and what are the health implications that result. Choosing to look at this through the lens of subjectivity formation uh, was specific in responding to the dominance of risk discourse in public health literature, uh, and also from uh, a place of seeking emancipation for a community that remains oppressed in Canadian society. This presentation will focus on one small objective from that study, the rest of which are available online if you'd like to read my very large thesis. Uh, but for our purposes today, the question here is to identify and document the intrinsic and extrinsic motivators associated with steroid use amongst this population in Manitoba. In other words, um, trying to find the good reasons for why, why it's so, so, uh, so common. The methodology used uh, was a Foucauldian post-structuralism um, and uh, the methods were Foucauldian discourse analysis. Uh, Foucauldian discourse analysis aims to illuminate the discourses at play that are shaping and configuring subjectivities and realities for study participants and look for what Foucault called biopolitical effects. Furthermore, and of benefit to the study, FDA also prompts us to look for the presence of counter discourses that substantiate 
the productive nature of power and the ways power and knowledge are linked to produce certain taken for granted truths. Uh, recruitment and sampling took place uh, primarily through social media and community organizations, particularly because the study uh, took place during the pandemic. Data collection uh, lasted for about six months. 17 semi-structured interviews were completed. There were two sample groups, a sample group of guys who had used them in the past or who would currently use them, and a group of guys who had considered using them but did not stop. Uh, data analysis was supported by journaling, memos, and logging, and all analysis took place in Max QDA. So in terms of results specific to this objective, uh, when looking at intrinsic motivations, things can be divided up into three main groups. Uh, the first is the self. Participants discussed how they understood and imagined how their bodies were perceived by others and how the ideal self in the eyes of others is impossible without the ideal body. Uh, they talked about the body. So participants were also acutely aware of how their perception of their own bodies or body image was tied to feeling a sense of self-worth and having social and sexual capital and power all participants were able to articulate that changing their body quickly and in ways that mirror dominant ideals, which were identified as white, masculine, and muscular, would re result in an increase in social power. The main discourse here, the dominant discourse that, that emerged was something that I call the trade-off. And I'll read this quote to you. And seeing you know, it's kind of hard being a black person, brown person, you see a lot of really hot white guys and they're just like, they won't fuck you, but then they won't aspire to date you because you're not this fantasy white guy that they're just dreaming of, this little marriage thing. And it's like, you kind of feel like shit because of what of that white people are. To be a white fit mass gay guy is like the top of the food chain. If I was full white, then I would be more desired. Another participant shared beauty has become something that you buy. When looking at extrinsic motivations, social media and porn were the absolute most dominant influence. All participants talked about social media and porn, as well as porn on social media when answering the question, who or what tells you that you need to consider or use steroids? Every participant specifically mentioned Instagram, and participants were also uh, able to clearly link social media to their sexual and social identities. The dominant discourse here that emerged is something that I call seeing is believing. And I'll quote one participant in saying, it, social media, doesn't tell you directly that you have to use, but when you see those pictures, you ask yourself the question, how can I achieve this body? How can I achieve this look? Emerging from this are two key discussion points I wanna leave you with. One is that two-spirit gay by queer men use steroids for good reasons, despite them being potentially risky. Um, and through a Foucauldian lens, we can call this what, what he called technologies of the self which permit individuals to affect by their own means or with the help of others, a certain number of operations on their own bodies and souls, thoughts, et cetera. In other words, uh, steroids are used as a, as, a, as a means of resisting domination. The second discussion point is that steroid use is intimately connected to sexuality and a sense of personal agency. All prospective users sought to gain or acquire sexual and social power, and all current users appreciated the link to their sexual identities. The discourses emerged from the data connected steroid use to muscle fetishes, an increase in partners, and a profound sense of desirability from leveling the playing field that was portrayed to them through social media. Finally, key, dis key discussion point three here is that we may be missing a key access point to engaging this group. In particular, this panel is focused on substance use. And one interesting thing that I found was that there was not um, a defined link between people who use steroids and services to support them, despite knowing that there is a causal pathway between steroid use and more serious forms of illicit substance use. With that in mind, a harm reduction approach might open up a pathway for this group to connect to care that would otherwise be challenging due to the stigma associated with getting help for traditional mainstream illicit substances. Recommendations that flow from this are to develop new systems and programs, conduct more research, and truly examine and interrogate and deconstruct the social structures that legitimize discursive regimes, particularly those that position whiteness, masculinity, and muscularity as dominant, powerful, and ideal. Thank you very much for enjoying this and spending some time with me. You can reach me at the contact information on the slide. And here are very briefly the references for this study. Thanks and have a really good rest of your summit.
Um, next up, we have uh, three presenters. Um, I'm sorry, two presenters um, uh, on moving past the poppers headache, updates on the Health Canada 2015 poppers, poppers crackdown. Uh, so we have Len Tooley, who brings over 15 years of community-based sexual health work, research and advocacy to his role as CDRC's evaluation and advancement director. Having managed numerous regional and national gay, bi and queer men's research initiatives and knowledge translation projects. He was also an HIV tester and counselor in Toronto's bathhouses for 10 years. As well, we have Cameron Schwartz, who is a knowledge translation coordinator with the BC Centre on Substance Use. He has a background in harm reduction and community-based research with a focus on substance use in queer communities. And now we will play their video. Hi, everyone. Thanks very much for joining. Uh, I'm Cameron Schwartz. I'm a Knowledge Translation Coordinator with the BC Centre on Substance Use, and I'm here with Len Tooley, who's the Director of Evaluation uh, and Advancement at CDRC. Uh, so this is an update on a summit presentation that we gave in 2018, where we talked a bit about the background and context around poppers, uh, and we talked about the scientific literature that was available around poppers use. Uh, and that was really framed in the context of the uh, 2013 decision to crack down on pauper sales in Canada. Uh, so this is a bit of an update on that. So we're going to be clarifying the policy context about paupers uh, and, and how they're treated in Canada, uh, making the case that the pauper ban rather than pauper's use itself is a public health issue. Uh, and we're going to be uh, talking about potential policy solutions that we've explored since that 20, uh, sorry, 2018 presentation. Thanks, Cameron. So, um, hi, everybody. We're not going to go into a lot of details about what poppers are or about harm reduction messaging. Um, this is sort of a poppers 2.0 presentation, but wanted to put some slides up there just in case folks wanted to watch the recording and um, read a little bit more. And so we're just going to jump right into the regulation of poppers in Canada. So in Canada, poppers are basically considered a prescription medication, of amyl nitrate specifically. Um, so, you know, like any prescription medication, if someone wants to access that or needs to access it, they, you know, speak to a doctor, they get a prescription from their doctor, and they can go buy it at a pharmacy. Um, the challenge in, our, in today's context is that there are no pharmaceutical manufacturers that, that produce poppers and have gone through the regulatory process to sell them. Um, in addition to that, unlike some other countries um, where poppers are considered prescription medications, in Canada, um, it's not permitted to, to import any prescription medications through the mail through, for personal use. Um, and so that really um, re uh, restricts access to, um, you know, sort of out of country sources of poppers. Now, in, since the 1970s, up until about 2013, poppers were sold as a consumer product, also not for human consumption. So they were sold as other things like leather cleaner, video head cleaner, and that was sort of overlooked by authorities. But we're not exactly sure why, and, but at some point in 2013, Health Canada decided to change their tune and started enforcing um, regu regulation on poppers to treat them as just a prescription medication, which like if, you know, if 7-Eleven um, started selling prescription medication, the same thing would happen. They sent officials into to the stores that were selling um, amyl nitrite, uh, removed them, and then threatened them with imprisonment and pretty significant fines if they continued to sell them, which really took away people's access to um, any form of poppers um, through any kind of commercial um, source. And um, that's meant that ever since then, uh, people's sources have been sort of illicit. So drug dealers, or they bring them in from out of the country, um, or companies, you know, or uh, businesses do, that do sell them there are really taking a significant risk. So let's talk a bit more about poppers uh, and the poppers ban as a public health issue. Uh, so our understanding of, of poppers from research uh, leads to a, a conceptualization of poppers that's really highly pathologized. Um, so things like heteronormativity, you know, the, the thinking of sex as penis and vagina sex very strictly, um, narratives around substance abuse, even though poppers really aren't addictive, uh, and really a focus in the literature on HIV prevention and STI prevention uh, has really driven a whole narrative of poppers use that's really focused on pathology. Uh, however, we know poppers do have legitimate benefits, right? So they uh, increase, um, they can increase pleasure during sex uh, and enable sexual intimacy. We also know the risk of negative outcomes is quite low and easily avoidable through harm reduction strategies. So it's very compelling to think of poppers as, as substances that are very harmful. They're associated with subversive behaviors and they smell very chemical, um, but we really don't observe uh, a lot of concrete harm associated with them. 
So thinking about poppers in the context of public policy in Canada, uh, we know that current policy actually increases harms. Uh, so because poppers are effectively now sold through an illicit market, um, it's more difficult to engage in harm reduction. Uh, so you can buy poppers and not really know what's in them. Uh, and it's also a missed opportunity for education around uh, safer poppers use. Uh, we also know that current policy is increasing stigma associated with poppers use because they're illicit. So um, we have the public health issue or problem. Now, what are our solutions? Um, you know, the, the two sort of uh, first options that we present, um, so poppers manufacturers go through regulatory process to sell them as a medication, um, and poppers, or go back to sort of pre-13, 2013 times when poppers are sold as a consumer product, not for human consumption. You know, there are challenges with those. We can't necessarily rely on poppers manufacturers to go through that process. Um, you know, if, if they're sold as, as leather cleaner, that prevents us from giving that harm reduction information that we want with the poppers. So a third option is for poppers to be sold as a consumer product that is for human consumption. And there are other substances that are treated like this, such as alcohol, cannabis, and tobacco. What, in order to get there though, um, that requires changes to the legislation and therefore political will. So there's three sort of strategies we're taking to move us towards that point. Thanks, Len. So the first strategy that we've really um, tried to uh, undertake uh, is to develop a community-informed understanding of poppers use. So as I mentioned, our, our scientific understanding of poppers use has been really biased by things like heteronormativity in the past. Uh, so what we tried to do to address that is, is so we've um, done some qualitative research based, based in Vancouver, um, focusing on poppers and, and Canadian policy. Uh, we've also done a critical review of research on poppers, so that's currently uh, submitted for publication. Uh, and CBRC also did a community consultation on poppers use. Uh, and, and current policy. So what we observed is really, um, I guess, not a surprise. Some people uh, are experiencing a lot of challenges associated with the ban. Um, so I won't go into too much detail about these uh, quotes. I'll invite you to, to pause the recording if you'd like and take a look. But they really demonstrate um, the impact that the poppers, current poppers policy is having on people's lives, including their sex lives, their ability to really have um, sexual intimate relationships with partners, um, and really feelings of ostracization. So with that, some of that information, um, one of the, you know, the second sort of key aspect of what we feel needs to happen is really changing the narrative on poppers um, and public opinion and perception. And so our, our goal here is to provide a more nuanced understanding of poppers and how it manifests in the lives of queer guys um, and effectively change poppers, you know, from being seen as this, this gay, scandalous gay sex drug to something that is a really important sexual aid um, for, for people, um, sort of similar to Viagra, but uh, for bottoms. Um, um, uh, there are, um, you know, barriers to effective advocacy for properties. We sort of discussed those, but we feel that now is sort of an opportunity, might be the right opportunity for us to start changing that narrative um, and gain to have some political traction. So what we've done is we've started a letter writing campaign. You can check it out at cbrc.net slash poppers. Um, basically, people put in their name, address, and, and um, sort of contact information, and this service sends a letter to their MP and the Minister of Health. Um, and we have had some good responses so far. Um, uh, for instance, the um, Michelle Rumble Gardner, the of the Conservative MP from Calgary, um, um, penned a statement um, suggesting that the minister, health minister, look into this, and it was very supportive. Um, we started that campaign before the election, and, and we had the election, so we're planning to re-engage uh, once the cabinet cabinet is selected and announced. Um, but our goal, you know, we are slowly chipping away, um, and we do think that at some point we'll be able to sort of at least get the government to do to sort of consider the the issue and address whether their policies are causing rather than reducing. That thank brings you. us to the end of our presentation. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, our emails are at the bottom of, of that uh, presentation. We look forward to your questions. Awesome. Well, a very important topic to many people uh, on this uh, call, um, or I guess this, uh, this uh, presentation uh, and participants as well. So thank you so much. Um, and then last but not least, uh, we have our uh, final panelists. Um, so this is going to be on the practice and perils of sex, drugs, and online technology, exploring the experiences of gay, bisexual, and other men, such as men. And we are uh, joined by uh, Dr. Christopher Dietzel, 
uh, who's he who pronouns, and he is a postdoctoral fellow who researches the intersections of gender, sexuality, safety, and technology. His current project investigates sexual consent related to dating app use and sexual violence against LGBTQ plus people. Since March 2020, he has also been researching app companies' responses to the COVID-19 pandemic. As well, we have Matthew Neumer, who is a professor and head of the Division of Health Promotion at Dalhousie University. His research interests include substance use, gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men's health, sexual health, online technologies, and Indigenous boys and men's sexual health. And lastly, Philip Joy, who is an assistant professor at, in the Department of Applied Human Nutrition at Mount St. Vincent University. He is a registered dietitian with the Nova Scotia Dietetic Association. He often uses arts-based methodologies for his research that focuses on nutrition, health, and the well-being of 2S LGBTQ plus folks. We'll now play their video in a moment. Hello everyone, my name is Chris Dietzel and I'm here to present to you our pre-recording of our session The Practices and Perils of Sex, Drugs and Online Technologies. So this is a session that I'm facilitating in uh, collaboration with my colleagues Matt Neumer and Philip Joy and we are excited to have you with us at the upcoming CBRC Summit at the end of October 2021. So in this short presentation, what I'm going to do is provide an overview of our recent research from the Wired Sex Project, which looked at gay, bisexual, and men who have sex with men's experiences with sexualized drug use. So in terms of the context of our research, uh, we recognize that online technologies like social networking sites, hookup apps, uh, these different types of websites and apps, they have drastically changed how gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men, GBMSM, interact with one another. At the same time, we also recognize that GBMSM's interactions have been impacted by their use of substances, such as uh, illicit drugs, pharmaceuticals, steroids. So these two factors come together uh, and impact their sexualized drug use with online technologies. And so what we want to, what we have studied in our research is how GBMSM indulge in excess and extreme pleasures that has been facilitated by online technologies and their use of substances while they engage in sex. And so in terms of the methodology of our research, we applied a net, netnographic uh, research approach, uh, which is a perspective that allowed us to investigate how people portray themselves on the internet. Uh, and we used post-structuralism and queer theory discourse analysis, which was an approach that we used to scrutinize what is considered normal in society and to investigate the practices of GBMSM who engage in sexual, sexualized drug use. Uh, so we also used the theory of assemblages, uh, which allowed us to study the changing connections between bodies and social networks. Uh, and in our research, bodies refers to GBMSM who interact with objects like sex, drugs, and online technologies. Um, and so in order to study GBMSM's experiences with sexualized drug use, what we did is we uh, conducted an online survey and interviews not only with GBMSM, but also with service providers who work with GBMSM. And so in our study, we had 50 GBMSM from around Canada. Uh, most of them identified as gay, though others identified as queer or bisexual. Some participants identified as a combination thereof, uh, and there were some folks who identified as two-spirit. Most of the participants were in Halifax, though some were also, well, 20 of them were in Halifax, 19 were in Ottawa, and 11 were in Vancouver. Uh, and as I mentioned before, data was gathered first from an online survey and then uh, through interviews. Um, GBMSM talked about, in their interviews and in the survey, they talked about their use of substances. Uh, cannabis was the most used, though they also used uh, other substances like poppers, uh, erectile dysfunction drugs, uh, GBH, and crystal meth. In terms of the service providers, we had 13 service providers who participated in this study. Uh, they were from different provinces across Canada. So they were from Ontario, BC, Nova Scotia, and Quebec, as well as Manitoba. Uh, and so the service providers worked in a variety of fields, including mental health and addictions counseling, service coordination and navigation, and community-based research. Uh, about half worked in sexual health and HIV STI pre prevention, and about half were involved in community outreach. 
So in terms of some key findings, uh, there's plenty that we can share with you, but in terms of time, I'm going to keep it brief. Uh, so first and foremost, in terms of GBMSM's experiences with sexualized drug use, what we found is that uh, they engaged in sexualized drug use because they were seeking elevated sexual experiences. And so they talked about being more ex open to exploring their sexuality, enjoying sex more, feeling more relaxed, feeling safe, uh, wanting to feel sex more intimately, more intensely. Uh, they also talked about wanting to have the sex they fantasized about and to en engage in sex for longer periods of time. They also discussed wanting to using sexualize or using drugs for sex uh, in order to lose inhibitions. Inhibitions. So they talked about how um, they would using drugs or in sex allowed them to uh, lose control, feel more comfortable, feel more social, and just feel more free in general. Uh, some of them specifically talked about wanting to enjoy bottoming or fisting or barebacking without worrying. And then they also discussed um, not just sexual inhibitions, but social inhibitions. So being nervous about meeting up, feeling unattractive or um, self-conscious, having hangups around their sexuality, or being uh, concerned about catching HIV, AIDS, and other STIs. Um, and lastly, they also mentioned the importance of intimate connections. And so this was discussed in reference to both their online interactions and their in-person interactions that could follow from connecting online. For the service providers that we, uh, that we interviewed for this study, they talked about destigmatizing sexualized drug use and the necessity of supporting GBSM. Uh, so they said that GBMSM engage in sexualized drug use to overcome in inhibitions, to free themselves. Uh, they use drugs and substances with the intention of losing control. And so providers felt that it was part of their responsibility to destigmatize de sexualized drug use, support opportunities for GBMSM to connect and form community, and to, le to link GBMSM to health services. However, there were several tensions that we, that we found in service providers' experiences as they talked about their work with GBMSM. So they talked about uh, how, GB, uh, how sexualized drug use can facilitate bonding among GBMSM, but they also said that this, this bonding could be limited because GBMSM might be battling other issues in their lives, such as internalized homophobia, problems with body image, uh, and other barriers around sex. Service providers also recognized that online technologies can facilitate negotiation of sexualized drug use by making frank conversations and about boundaries and desires easier online than it would be in person. However, they noted that GBMSM who have these conversations online might not actually follow through in person. So just because they have a conversation online about consent or barriers or boundaries doesn't necessarily mean that they will hold to those in person. Another tension we found is that service providers said that they did not want to uh, be judgmental or pathologize, pathologize GBMSM, uh, but they were also, but again, they realized their, their responsibility in supporting GBMSM, uh, particularly those who struggle with addiction or problematic sexualized drug use. And lastly, uh, they also emphasized the importance of harm reduction in education. So they said that there's many different strategies that can be used to educate both themselves as service providers and address their personal biases as they work with GBMSM, but also to educate GBMSM. And so they discussed uh, using workshops, they said using apps themselves, uh, and a variety of other strategies in order to engage in harm reduction and education among GBMSM communities. So with that, unfortunately, I'm just about out of time. So I wanted to encourage you uh, to learn more about this work. And one way you can do so is visiting our website. So we are the Shag Lab, the Sexual Health and Gender Research Lab. Our website is shaglab.ca. Uh, looks like it cut off uh, just uh, a little early there. Um, great logo, by the way. Um, and um, yeah, so. Uh, visit them at the shag lab i don't know if you wanted to just put in the um get a website uh, and then the team maybe you could just pop it into the chat as that was um wasn't uh, provided there uh, at the end so um i just wanted to thank all of the panelists for their presentations and we're going to move into the q a and discussion portion of this uh, event um, if you haven't already done so, you can post your questions or comments into the chat box.
And I haven't seen anyone. Oh, actually, to see uh, Ben uh, has a question for Jared. Um, he's curious if you could say a bit more about the Pokemonic uh, normative masculinities that might shape these asterism and folk communities. Hi, Ben. Thanks. I could say a lot. And actually, <laughs> uh, I, there were six objectives in the study. I started off with three, I ended up with six. And so there's a lot of data, uh, some of which is under review right now and will be coming out. Um, hegemonic and normative masculinities configured into the data quite specifically. Um, obviously, I don't think it's a stretch or a surprise to anybody that the images that are portrayed through social media are, um, are of a particular kind of body. Like we've talked about this at many summits and David Brennan's research comes to mind as, as something that had a big influence on me uh, when I started looking at this field. Um, and so uh, I think in the short amount of time I have, what I would say is I would reiterate the point about the, the, idealized, uh, the idealized self and the idealized body being portrayed or through discourses that are portrayed and re-portrayed through social media. Um, are, are huge influences. And uh, while every single participant talked about Instagram and social media, what they were really talking about were the, were the social realities that they consumed on a daily basis at greater rates than they ever had before. And so um, absolutely hegemonic and normative masculinity is a very big player in that. Um, and steroids were really a, a, a means for um, people who use them to resist that domination uh, that's present within the construction of that kind of social reality. So um, lots to say, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, I don't wanna take up everyone else's time though. Thanks. Thanks, Jared. And along a similar vein, um, we have another question that's um, asking about um, body image and it really came up in everyone's work. Um, and wondering if there's any um, thoughts or reflections or any presenter you wanted to share. I'll kind of just open it up to anyone who, who might have a, something to say about that. I, I could say something in the absence of anyone else jumping ahead of me. Um, just briefly, one of the other interesting things that came through in the study was the way that technology was 100% implicated in the construction or the, the, the formation of subjectivities related to body image. And so it's interesting to hear from my colleagues at the Shag Lab, yes to the logo, very cute, um, that I actually, in my PhD proposal, wrote up uh, using theories of assemblages and actor network theory to look at social media, steroid use, and, uh, and, and sexuality or a sense of self, because there really is no, there is no line between the two, and then both are acting upon each other in a very impactful way. And so I'm going to reach out <laughs> and have a conversation with you folks about that. But, but yeah, my, my point here is, is that a body image and body image and technology are now incredibly linked, uh, or it's not a surprise and that there's a lot of work to be done to start teasing apart um, what that means. So yeah, so maybe I'll jump in there. Uh, just didn't want to jump ahead of any thanks for the shout out for the logo it wasn't my design. I'm not that creative but uh, we certainly did approve it. Um, in terms of the, I mean, the bodies are always occupying sort of this, particularly in relation to the online stuff that we did, this sort of contested space, which is really, I mean, it permeates everything that we're doing here. And because we were, you know, we're looking at a lot of not only, you know, sexual behavior, but how sexual and gender identities are manifested, constructed, assembled, so to speak. Um, I mean, the body becomes the site of that organization. And I know I'm talking in like high, like theoretical terms here, but across everybody that we talked to, the, the, the thinking around the body and whether it was relieving anxieties um, for gay men and muscularity and steroids, or whether it was relieving anxieties among trans guys who were talking about you know, disclosing and arriving in these sexual spaces, you know, the, and, and that was also part of the reason we wanted to use a diversity of drugs within our study. We didn't limit it to one thing as we wanted to sort of hear the voice around how the, these things came into play, but um, certainly 
you know, you could talk, I could talk about this forever, but I mean, the, the body was, it is that site of, of contestation of all of the things. And um, yeah, so. Awesome. Well, thank you. I think too, this really highlights how queer communities use substances quite differently in different contexts than non queer communities. Um, and so it is definitely it's so important to have these types of discussions. Um, just to uh, move on, we have another uh, question, which I don't think anyone this call will be able to answer, but it really is um, highlighting some of the importance of uh, lesbian or queer women interactions on hookup apps and sexual practices through hookup apps. Um, and um, points out that most of the research is really only about social interactions. Um, I don't think there's anyone who can answer that here, but if there is, then we can jump in. Go ahead, Chris. I mean, I, I haven't done work in this field specifically, but uh, a colleague of mine, Stephanie Duguay, who's at Concordia University in Montreal, has done a lot of work in this area. So I won't speak about it today, but like, I encourage you to check out her work. Awesome, thank you. Um, to continue on, um, there's a note here about the importance of pleasure uh, in this work. Um, and often kind of this context around substances really around like harms and what uh, all the bad things that could potentially happen to substance use. Um, and the question is, are there ways pleasure could be further centered in substance use services for folks in the community? So I'm like, sorry, uh, go ahead, Matt. I'll go after you. All right, I'll I'll be brief. Uh, I can talk forever, obviously. Uh, I would say that um, I was kind of struck. I went back and was reading some of our papers on this study, and I think far more than harms and the other things, the focus on pleasure, community connection, and a lot of the unexpected aspects of uh, drug use on online did come out. And so we may not have highlighted that completely in our presentation, which tends to go a certain way, but um, yeah, we, we do put it out there. And forthcoming is our community report. It isn't out yet, but we're working on it, uh, which I think will address a lot of that. Awesome. Cameron? Uh, yeah, I was just gonna add as well. I mean, pleasure, like talking about we know we've done a lot of work around poppers use. This is obviously like a central theme and sort of this tension between recognizing and, and sort of valuing pleasure in substance use and, and sort of the traditional biomedical approach to both research and public health response, which is very much pleasure averse. Uh, so I think it's an important question to be asking. I, I think we could probably do a lot more in terms of recognizing pleasure, not just within substance use, but around sexual health conversations as well. Like what is good sex? And, you know, a broader conversation outside of just STIs and HIV. Like, I think that's a really important question to be asking. Uh, I'm gonna flag, there's a really great paper um, that I like to come back to by David Moore uh, from Australia. So I'll, I'm just gonna flag that in the chat because I think it's really relevant. Awesome, thank you. Um, so actually I have a question for uh, Tara. Um, I, I noticed within your presentation, uh, just because you were also looking like at queer youth and um, really like with these intersections of like mental health. And I'm, I'm wondering if you could maybe elaborate a little bit more on stigma. Um, and I, I think that was a thing like I'd heard in all of the presentations, but just curious if you could speak a bit more about, um, about your, your research on that. About, about the stigmas, the intersectional stigma? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it, it was interesting. A lot of the participants we had really underlined the fact that they felt double or even triply stigmatized when they seeked mental health professional care, especially uh, trans participants who mentioned that uh, when they spoke to healthcare professionals, they asked them to stop consuming completely cannabis before being able to access medication, before being able to access gender reassignment surgery, uh, psychotherapy. So there was a double stigma already with mental health and gender related issues. And, and other participants also spoke of an additional stigma within, um, within their communities that related to racial issues. So these participants were positioned in an even 
even more severe intersection about you know the stigmas of talking about mental health and then about gender identity and then about sexual identity and about cannabis consumption. So a lot of these really interrelated and created additional marginalization. So that's kind of what we seek to do with the exhibit too. We want to create a space where the participants are going to feel at ease to talk about mental health, how they use cannabis to address mental health issues without feeling these many, many stigmas. Awesome. And maybe if you wouldn't mind putting in the chat just uh, any where to reach you around the, that um, stuff from the exhibit, I think people would appreciate uh, yes. being able to build that. Absolutely. There. And maybe we just, almost, oh, sorry. sorry, go ahead. We almost have a, our website is almost ready to go, our collab website, but uh, I'll shoot my email address out so you can reach me there. Um, our website should be up in a couple of weeks, up and running. Awesome. Um, and just maybe um, lastly, I'll just maybe ask Len to talk uh, briefly just about a bit more about um, risk and pleasure and then we'll uh, end the uh, presentation. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I just sent Chris a little message to to flag that. I, I love the question and, and, you know, risk and pleasure are two things that I love talking about. And I, one of the few sort of a couple ideas that I wanted to sort of raise that I have around risk and pleasure. I mean, to me, like risk is part of pleasure, right? Like it's, it's not like, you know, this potential negative outcome that's separate from it. It's like part of the whole like experience of pleasure is recognizing, understanding those risks, taking risks, right? There's a benefit and like potential like um, there are some negative things that can happen, but those are also part of pleasure, right? Like pleasure is not just this one uniform thing. I mean, a lot of the literature and a lot of time, I mean, in my career that I've seen is like, there, it is this focus on <clears throat> what are the risks of involved, right? And it's almost like this puritanical sense that there's this perfect world that can be created where <clears throat> there's no STIs and there's no HIV transmission and that, um, <clears throat> and that everyone is behaving well so that, so that those negative outcomes from a public health perspective aren't happening. But in sort of the worlds that I that I navigate, like those are part and parcel of like just of life and of, of, of sort of, of seeking pleasure and um, and not necessarily separate from it. So I do think that there is there is a way to talk about risk in the sense of risk management and, and you know, almost like risk acceptance, right? Like accepting and acknowledging that there's gonna, there could be some consequences to, you know, to the pleasure that I'm experiencing, right? And that's, that's yeah. part of the navigation. So sorry to cut you off. Um, we are uh, just at the end. Um, and I think we could easily spend another hour talking about this and barely scratch the surface. Um, so I would like to thank um, all of the participants and presenters for attending and being a part of today's session. Uh, we'd like to remind you that you can share your feedback and insights on the session with continued evaluation on the right panel on your screen. Um, and we will now pause here and transition to the next session. So there's about a five minute break. Um, please check the schedule or program for programming details and enjoy the rest of the summit and thank you so much.